So uh, thanks, thank you everyone for being here today. I also want to thank the chamber, uh, their director, Chris Weber, and the whole board, uh, Joe Popley as well. Thank you for those kind words. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, Component Repair Technology, John Gallagher, one of our absolute best companies in the city and a great success story for us. Uh, Mentor Public Library as well under uh, Cheryl Keenan, Remarkable Lake County. Thank you, Neil. And uh, of course, uh, Miko. And I want to give special recognition to Kelly Conrad, who very humbly said that Miko is doing better. She's really revitalized that organization and doubled the portfolio in the last year. So uh, she's doing a fantastic job there. Also want to recognize uh, members of our city council. Um, they've been mentioned already, but worth mentioning again, President Matt Donovan, Vice President Scott Marr, uh, Councilwoman Janet Dowling, Councilman Ray Kirchner, Councilman John Krieger, Councilman Sean Blake, and Councilman uh, Mark Freeman, who had a, a conflict today, or would otherwise be with us. And I say this every year, but it's, uh, it's very true. Um, very much appreciate the support that we get from council. The administration and council works very closely together. And it, were it not for their vision and support, we would not be able to accomplish a lot of the things that I'll be talking about here today. So moving on. So some of you may have heard that there's this little thing called inflation out there that's uh, in the news right now. And it's quite timely because exactly 100 years ago on this day, one of the greatest American economists of the 20th century, uh, a man named William J. Baumel, was born in the South Bronx. So you might say, what does that have to do with the state of our city? Well, as a professor at Princeton, he developed a breakthrough theory commonly known as Baumel's cost disease which explains why increased wages in manufacturing uh, ultimately results in, in uh, that result from uh, productivity increases and technology advances also raises the wages of, of uh, service sector jobs in fields like healthcare, education, entertainment, and public services. Um, it's a relative matter, really, uh, if a cellist in a string quartet whose basic job hasn't changed in hundreds of years doesn't compare favorably to a factory worker, uh, then the rest of us are going to be denied the pleasure of going to concerts, which of course are very much in demand because no one would enter that profession. Baumel's cost disease theory also explains why inflationary rates tend to be higher for services than in goods manufacturing. manufacturing. Uh, even with rising wages, technology allows for the cost of goods to go down over time whereas teachers, police officers, doctors, for example, still rely predominantly on their personal exertions uh, to complete their work. It's why that big screen TV that cost $3,000 in the year 2000 costs $300 today, yet a college education is double after that same uh, time period. So, because you're not here for a lesson in economics, why is this important to us? Well, it's important because Baumel's insight accurately envisioned the modern economy and where it will likely go in the future. Um, it predicts that services uh, will either become increasingly more costly or simply go away. There was a time when domestic servants, maids and butlers were, were a common thing both here and, and abroad, but the cost to employ them grew to a point that essentially eliminated the profession for all but the wealthy. I don't think you'd see Alice living with the Brady Bunch today in all likelihood. But today, the $15 an hour fast food counter worker is already giving way to automated uh, kiosks for taking orders. So this reality presents a number of implications for cities. Um, we are entirely a service organization dependent on human capital. Can we compete for labor in an inflationary job market and still keep our taxes reasonable? How will private sector measures to keep costs down in the service sector affect the, ta the tax base? One of the big issues among cities right now is um, the, what appears to be a more permanent change to people working from home. So in Ohio, you pay your income taxes where you work, not where, necessarily where you live. So cities like uh, um, if you work for a company in Mentor in the township or another city, you're not necessarily paying your uh, your income taxes to us. Can we predict what services will go away and prepare for it? Um, online retail, Amazon was mentioned as part of uh, John's comments 
and the growth of online retail is obviously uh, consolidating much of the retail market. What does that mean for cities like Mentor, who has a very high presence of brick and mortar retail? And finally, what industry sectors will support service efficiency and should we be pursuing them now as, as part of our economic development efforts? Um, good example of that, and we are, by the way, a good example of that is digital medical diagnostic technologies. Um, this is a huge and growing field. You know, can, you, can a doctor uh, remotely be able to monitor the well-being of more patients rather than seeing them in person? So a successful city must be able to meet the challenges presented in this modern economy if we are to be able to deliver to our residents the job opportunities that they would expect and also um, the opportunities and benefits that flow from them. So let's talk a little bit about some of those benefits. Every, everyone in this room is aware of the fact that, um, or, or directly felt the pinch of the shortage of qualified employee applicants. And I can tell you that the number of qualified applicants is diminishing as well in, uh, for public safety workers, which certainly raises a concern at a time when uh, ever, uh, there's ever increasing scrutiny of the work of police officers. The city of Menor has actually always prided itself on perhaps the most rigorous screening process to identify the best police officer candidates. This process by its very nature means that we will probably disqualify more people than we will actually consider for our police officer uh, positions. So recognizing this, uh, Chief Ken Gunch is taking steps to both improve recruiting and sustain the quality and well-being of our officers over, over their careers. Uh, this past year, we utilized for the first time the National Testing Network uh, for civil service testing, which opens up the candidate pool to a national and a much more diverse audience. With the help of a grant through the Justice Department, um, uh, the police department started a comprehensive wellness program aimed at reducing stress and improving coping skills uh, through both physical and mental assistance. We partnered with uh, Lake Health and Crossroads Health so that our officers could learn about things like uh, proper nutrition, strength and conditioning. Uh, they also received no cost counseling through this program, as well as some of our officers are being trained to act as mental health peer supporters. And the goal of the program is to understand the link between physical and mental health and to remove the stigma that uh, sometimes exists on uh, being able to uh, attend to one's uh, mental health. We did get a grant this year to continue the program, uh, to move it forward, and I'm happy to say that Crossroads Health is actually built off of our model and is now offering uh, a, some, a similar form to, uh, account to um, all first responders in a, in a countywide program. So in our opinion, healthier first responders lead to better performance on the job over a career and ultimately to better outcomes uh, for the people that we serve. We also continue to provide the best training and tools to increase their, their effectiveness. In November, our officers uh, went to Cuyahoga Community College for specialized range training using their 300 degree video range simulator. This is a uh, virtual program that has 100 different uh, response scenarios that allows our officers to recognize threats and to react to those threats with the appropriate level of force, including deadly force. Um, we thought that this was uh, well received and we'll probably continue with this going forward. Also over the last year, and you've seen some of this reported in the papers, uh, we've implemented 15 automatic license plate readers uh, utilizing a company called Flock. And these aid our patrol division by uh, increasing the eyes that, are, that exist throughout the city. These are strategically placed at entry points in the city. These license plate readers automatically see everyone who enters from there. It ties into a national uh, crime database and in real time alerts our officers on the road if, whether there are outstanding warrants or um, stolen vehicles or if there are endangered persons. Uh, we used this over 100 times over just the last year and it ultimately uh, resulted in 63 arrests. And with those arrests, we also saw some more serious crimes that came to light as a result, including uh, drug possession, drug trafficking, 
uh, and weapons violations. We recovered, we recovered 22 stolen vehicles and located four endangered persons, one of which uh, was a runaway juvenile that was traveling across country with a known sex offender from another state. Um, another was actually a missing mentor resident that, that with dementia. So this has been a hugely effective tool for us. And so as a result of that, we're going to be adding 14 more of those this year for a total of 29. And it really is almost like having extra officers uh, on the road. Our fire department, uh, the well-being of our firefighter paramedics has been a constant source of concern during the pandemic as they experienced their busiest year ever on record in 2021. Um, it's really difficult to fully appreciate the stress that's placed on our, our paramedics when you, when you understand that uh, they have to treat every single call as a COVID-related incident. And uh, Chief Bob Searles and his people did this over 8,800 times last year. I'm really uh, proud of the fact that we've successfully adapted our services to be able to uh, meet with the best available equipment and some creativity to meet the challenges that, that the pandemic created for us. You see on that far right part of the picture, um, all of our uh, paramedics wear the powered air purifying respirators. We call them PAPRs uh, for short. And they really provide the best level of protection for blocking viruses, uh, much, much more, more so than even N95 masks. Um, uh, CRT has been a great partner with us. If you look at the top left portion of that picture, they actually helped us to construct for each of our rescue squads, squads patient isolation boxes to be able to treat patients and still provide a level of protection against the virus. And then on the bottom there, you see um, a decontamination unit that will be placed in each of our stations. Uh, they actually, uh, you can actually place the uh, turnout gear in those de decontamination units and um, decontaminate them after, uh, after a run. And I'm really happy to say that those are actually created by Crestcore. Again, one a great mentor company adapting to some of the changes uh, that, that we faced in the last year. When the time came as well, uh, Mentor was one of the communities that led the way, uh, of course, with our great partners, the General Health District. I know Ron Graham is here with us today, and we appreciate all his help in uh, helping us get through this. But when the time came our, uh, uh, through our drive-through uh, vaccination drives and our walk-in clinics, uh, our people actually distributed 17,000 vaccines um, just here in Mentor alone. And to give you some idea of how well Lake County has done in this effort, we are actually number two right now in the state for the uh, percentage of the population of the 88 counties, uh, for the percentage of the population that has been vaccinated. So um, great effort all around by our county, our organizations, our, our cities, and um, uh, all of the county folks as well. So I also want to give a shout out to all of our city employees that are here today. Um, extreme, very, very proud, extremely proud of all our city employees and how they met this public challenge uh, through the pandemic. Um, all our employees came to work throughout this. Um, a lot of other cities and many state offices closed down or worked from home, but, all of our, but our doors never closed to the public. Um, we adapted some of our services. You can see in some of these images we did uh, drive-through services at our senior center for uh, seniors who needed meals. We did, we did a, a whole variety of online content for seniors that were uh, captive at home. And um, yes, our people got sick along the way, but they came to work and accepted that risk because of their commitment to serving this community. In addition to the risks associated with emergency medical runs, other risks are business as usual for our firefighters. A couple of high profile events that are worth mentioning this year. One just last December was at the Bolton Estate Fire. And because of an active uh, gas fed, this was an active natural gas fed fire at the time, it resulted in explosions that could be heard throughout the community. And our, our guys did a great job of containing that. No one was hurt in the process. And um, great job, well done. In addition to that, uh, we had a, uh, a fire on, uh, in the headlands on Forest Road that involved three structures, displaced two families, and again, no one was hurt in, in, in those incidents, and uh, 
uh, including our firefighters. And as, so as the community grows and changes, uh, we are tasked with preparing for the many response scenarios that present themselves now and in our future. Uh, just this past August, August, we saw the completion of our regional response, emergency regional response facility, which we've been working on for the better part of the last year and a half. Um, and this consolidates the equipment and vehicles used for many of the specialty responses uh, that we provide both for our city and all of Lake County. And um, this facility will also serve because of its proximity to the airport. It will also serve as a key location to receive uh, and house and coordinate resources that could be needed for a large scale disaster response and also serve as a potential command site. So you'll see in this next video, um, one of these specialty units, our water rescue dive team performing recently um, an activity, a training activity. And uh, if you know how cold it's been lately, you can appreciate that they were doing that in single digit weather. You'll see uh, one of our guys in the water here in a minute. Um, but this facility will house, house the water rescue unit the Mass Casualty Incident Response Unit, uh, the Urban Search and Rescue Team, which is the uh, Region 2 for the state of Ohio, a Hazardous Material Unit, a Bomb Squad, and um, flipping to the next page, a Technical Rescue Team Equipment. And just this past December, our uh, members of our Technical Rescue Team were called out to the city of Lakewood to assist with the collapse of a parking garage. So. Again, you see that the equipment that's required for that is large and bulky and, and requires uh, um, a lot of space to contain. This new facility will also contain uh, the Mentor EMT Academy, and Superintendent Porter talked about that a little bit last month, but this is for high school seniors uh, to be able to get hands-on instruction with the goal of receiving, receiving state certification as an emergency uh, uh, medical technician at the end of the program. And this will prepare them for a number of career services, in, including uh, those uh, for the city. But for us, it's uh, not only a great opportunity to cooperate with the schools, but it's a good recruitment tool for us to be able to increase that pool of qualified applicants that I said was, is uh, dwindling these days. Um, we have a great partnership with the school. Uh, I'll make mention of another program this year. Uh, because of the pandemic, we haven't been able to give fire prevention instruction to our third graders at Safety Village as we have done in the past. So our fire prevention officers actually created three different videos that um, are being uh, incorporated into the curriculum by the third grade teachers here in the Mentor School District. So that's, a, again, it continues to be a great partnership for us. And then this year, in uh, 2022, we're going to be beginning the process of replacing the fire station that serves District 3. Station 3 is our oldest station, built in 1965. It's undersized, uh, pretty, pretty much obsolete, and not really ideally located, given that the housing and commercial growth is uh, much further to the south of this station. So we'll be looking to acquire uh, land this year and perhaps start the design with the goal of construction no later than 2024. Um, also want to uh, make mention of our police and fire dispatch because they are a, an absolute vital part of our integrated service model. The level of our dispatcher training complements the work of our paramedics life-saving efforts and that was never more uh, apparent than uh, a story that we're going to tell here shortly. Tim Johns, who's here with us today, um, was, uh, took a call earlier within the last year and was able to help a mother resuscitate um, their infant child that had stopped breathing. And uh, rather than me tell the story, I'm going to let uh, CNN do that because this was picked up by national news and shown on uh, CNN's network. When a frantic mother dialed 911 after her two-month-old baby stopped breathing, a quick-thinking dispatcher put his training to the test. A terrified new mother calls 911. 911, what is the location of your emergency? And dispatcher Tim Johns is on the other end. He stopped breathing. Please, 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 please
Johns, a six-year veteran of the Mentor Ohio Emergency Dispatch Unit, instinctively relied on his training. We're going to start CPR, okay? I just remember thinking of my children at the time, saying what would I want if this was going through, make sure I'm articulate with my instructions, make sure I check every single box. Coaching Beverly on how to revive her son, even counting with her as she gave chest compressions. I literally was like he was in my living room with me, talking me through it, telling me I can do this. And she did. He just moved a little. When paramedics arrived minutes later, Elliot was breathing. So nice to meet you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You did a great job. So cute. I think that deserves a hand, huh? While we're proud to have moments like that, it's worth, it's worth saying that our, our safety services are second to none in the state of Ohio when these type of life-saving uh, occurrences happen uh, almost on a daily basis with our people. So that round of applause applies to all of you in the room. Um, finally, one of our proudest moments as a community came in June of last year when we dedicated a lasting memorial in honor of those who have lost their lives uh, serving as police officers and firefighters uh, with the city of Menor. This, was, this memorial was, was designed by a committee of policemen and, and firemen and uh, was dedicated on the third anniversary of the loss of patrolman Matthew Mazzani. And uh, we are grateful to uh, Brunner Sand and Dietrich Funeral Home and their families who insisted that they cover the entire cost of that, uh, of that memorial. And uh, you know that's a great example of uh, the importance and the closeness of the bond that our first responders have with the community that they serve. Um, in a similar way, we're going to be uh, looking at an opportunity to uh, do more to better honor those veterans who have both served in the armed forces and lost their lives there by uh, starting a new project this year that we think will be completed by 2023, which we're calling the Cemetery Memorial Promenade. And what it will do is align the Civil War Memorial with um, the uh, 1860s structure that you see there in the foreground. Uh, and in between, we'll move the all branch memorial that sits on the south end of the cemetery. Obviously, the whole area will be improved with some pavers and lighting and landscaping. And it will just create a, 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 just a more significant way to honor our, our veterans. The pandemic continues to challenge men or employers, uh, but it hasn't lessened interest and investment in our city. 2021 saw over 100 new business starts in our community, both from uh, small uh, family startups to uh, large commercial ventures. Kevin Malachek and his staff have done a great job in meeting private sector needs in this regard. Mentor continues to grow its health sector at a fast pace. Uh, this past year, we saw the introduction into our market of Johnson Orthodontics, AFC Urgent Care, and uh, currently under construction is Optima Dermatology on Reynolds Road. This is a 5,700 square foot medical office that's, uh, you see this uh, steel skeleton up right now. They'll be focusing on skin cancer treatment. These are Cleveland Clinic doctors that will be working there. They, their research showed that within a 30-minute drive of this location, uh, it, it takes about 90 days to get a dermatology appointment. And if you are experiencing a, a melanoma, that can metastasize in 60 days. So this is going to be a great contribution to the overall uh, healthcare landscape in our, in our city. And then, of course, the Cleveland Clinic Manor Hospital was uh, some of the, one of the big uh, news stories of the year. Uh, that is currently under construction. We're pleased to have our uh, first hospital within our city limits here. This uh, structure will have 34 inpatient rooms, 22 outpatient rooms, 19 emergency room bays, and they'll be focused on digestive disease, uh, general surgery, pulmonary, urology, heart and vascular, orthopedics, and emergency care. And um, they have called this their most, uh, Cleveland Clinic has referred to this as its most expandable and flexible hospital in its global network. 
So as I said in my comments that you see me uh, giving there at the groundbreaking, uh, projects like this are transformative for communities. And it's not just because of the tens of millions of dollars and uh, the hundreds of jobs that it'll create, but it also integrates us into Cleveland Clinic's global healthcare system, uh, which raises our community profile um, as a result of that as a location for world-class healthcare. And to underscore the emphasis that the clinic places on the new mentor campus, you need only hear it from their CEO, Dr. Tom Mahaljevic. We do believe that this hospital, Mentor Hospital, will be the model for the future of healthcare delivery. It is designed to be innovative, flexible, and efficient. And at Cleveland Clinic Hospital here, we will deliver the same high quality care and experience as we do at every location, and this is our promise. So this global connection is particularly helpful to us as we leverage the assets of the city and the region to bolster our international trade initiative, which continues to gain ground despite the pandemic. Um, we continue to provide educational content to our business community. Uh, this past year, we, we put on a seminar uh, called the Global Perspective on International Contracts and Agreements. This month we will be uh, putting on a uh, seminar on international standards for exporters. And, um, you know, this program requires us to really engage with many partners along the way. And uh, one of those is, has already been introduced to us, our, our friends here with the law firm of Howard Kennedy. We have with us uh, Howard Goulden, Jonathan Polden, Nana Jarnez and Alex Watt, and um, they helped this year, along with Stephen uh, Roth, putting on uh, a seminar called the, the Ohio-UK Business Corridor. So that was, again, providing this content to uh, manufacturers and businesses here, trying to connect them with businesses, in this case, in the UK. And they've been very helpful in assisting us in understanding the needs of British companies uh, coming to the U.S. and also working with local companies to reach the U.K. market. We also put on our fourth uh, annual conference on innovation trade. That was a virtual conference this year uh, that focused on U.S. and Ohio healthcare opportunities. And we uh, uh, were able to return to Europe this year in person for a trade mission this past fall. And when we take these trips, they of course include attending industry events such as trade shows but the primary focus is really on establishing and fostering relationships with agencies who represent large groups of private manufacturers and companies with an interest in establishing a U.S. Uh, presence. So we uh, spent a lot of time maintaining relationships with the existing partners. You see some of them on that screen. We did presentations to the Greater Birmingham Chamber of Commerce, to the East Midlands Chamber of Commerce, to the Galway Technology Center in Ireland, to uh, companies at the Medilink Midlands MedTech Expo. Uh, we did a presentation to the British American Business Council, as well as we continue to work on a uh, community to community relationship and to formalize that relationship potentially with the uh, Charnwood Borough in England, which has a, a very strong aerospace sector that we're interested in, in pursuing. So um, we're also increasing our presence with new engagements. We met with 17 different agencies this year in uh, uh, the UK, Ireland, and France. And um, you can see some of those, I won't, I won't mention them. But uh, f just from these initial engagements, we generated you know, dozens of leads, about 15 of which uh, Kevin Malachek and his team are following up on. One of them has already visited our community and is in interested in perhaps planting a flag here. And as these agency relationships mature, what's most important about these is that they can become a conduit for uh, ongoing business flow in our direction. So while we aspire to recruit international companies here, one of our other tasks is, is to assist mentor companies who are trying to identify international market opportunities. One such company, RB Sigma, um, and it, its, uh, its founder joined us this year, uh, Justin Bloyd on our trip, and he actually um, walked away with uh, and is working toward two potential partnership arrangements as a result of that. Our plans in 2022 include um, another, our, our fifth annual Innovation and Trade Conference, which may or may not be able to be in person, 
and uh, we're uh, closely collaborating right now with the Ohio Aerospace Institute on events that uh, will increase opportunities probably in the spring and the summer for Mentor Aerospace companies. It, generally speaking, Mentor Manufacturing remains strong. Just a few projects that, that are worth mentioning that happened over this past year or are moving forward now. Uh, Sunny's Diamond Shine is a, a company that is currently renovating a 110,000 square foot building on Tyler Boulevard. They're making an $18 million investment. They actually produce the cleaning fluids that are utilized in car washes. G&T Manufacturing, uh, uh, doing business right now on Pinecone, which is a CNC machining shop, will be expanding and constructing a new 38,000 square foot uh, facility for additional production. They currently are housed in a 17,000 foot building. Uh, there's somewhat of a new concept to our city this year. This is called Rise Mentor. It's uh, going to be located on Tyler Boulevard near Justin Drive. And um, this is actually a, a, a co-warehousing facility. So what they do is they, they provide storage for manufacturers of, say, mid-size and smaller manufacturers that are looking to temporarily house product and inventory so that they can expand their uh, production capacity. They will be building 17 of these buildings on this site. And uh, from their own data, it shows that a lot of the companies that work with them tend to expand after about three years in the general area uh, where, where they're uh, co-warehousing. So we're hoping that this looks, uh, turns out to be somewhat of a type of an accelerator for us going forward. Uh, we are pleased to see the groundbreaking and, and current construction of the Alliance for Working Together's Trade School, also on Tyler Boulevard. This is, uh, they will be providing STEM-focused uh, educational programs to expose the workforce of tomorrow to opportunities in manufacturing. We're joined uh, by the county commissioners some of the, here today, and I understand that uh, both their office and their workforce uh, development team is working on some grants to be able to fund some of these programs moving forward to allow uh, some of the young people coming through our schools to look at manufacturing as a career without expense to them. We also continue to see growth with commercial and professional space in our city. The Classic Auto Group will be constructing a new service and repair center behind their Cadillac uh, dealership on Tyler Boulevard. If you haven't uh, been inside the uh, newly refurbished Platinum Center, on Center Street, it's some of the most beautiful office space in our city right now. That was the members of our council attending the uh, ribbon cutting for that earlier this year. The Newell Creek Professional Center on Norton Parkway will be under construction and expected to be completed by the end of this year. That's a 20,000 square foot commercial space. Um, uh, again, and they're uh, taking uh, orders for space right now if you're interested. The Uptown Mentor Project, we expect to move forward this year. We continue to work with them on a number of uh, uh, grant opportunities that they're still pursuing. They'll be uh, redeveloping six parcels in the Old Village District. Again, this is a 40,000 square foot facility. Top three floors, a four-story building, the top three floors will be office space, and the ground floor will uh, be either a retail or restaurant. On the retail side of things, uh, Mentor continues to be a destination for national and larger regional players. I think everyone was excited a couple weeks ago when we uh, finally opened the Trader Joe's store. That's a 14,000 square foot building and a $3 million investment by them. The city also contributed uh, $900,000 to widen the lanes there and put in the traffic signal, which was essential to allowing that project to move forward. Uh, we've also uh, saw the opening of two new Starbucks this year, one on Menor Avenue and one on Tyler Boulevard. Also, the Bibby Bops uh, on uh, Route 306. They do uh, Asian fast casual food, and my beautiful wife Beverly and our son Kenneth just had their first meal there, and they gave it the thumbs up, so it's good enough for me. So. Uh, Azteca Mexican Restaurant on Diamond Center Boulevard also broke their ribbon this year. Raising Canes on Center Street is uh, under construction right now and expected to open relatively soon. Uh, the new shopping plaza that is at 7720 Menor Avenue that currently holds the, holds the 
uh, sleep number uh, store. We'll, uh, on the other side of that, we'll uh, see the entry into our market of Condado's Taco. And Panera Bread will be uh, building a new freestanding restaurant in the outer portion of the parking lot at the Points East uh, development. We also have exciting projects that are homegrown and uh, offer even greater diversity to our local cuisine. And it's exciting to be able to talk about these uh, for me because it reinforces uh, confidence in the men or market, you know, especially at a time when you see a lot of the restaurants having a hard time making a go of it because of the labor shortages and that. So to see uh, in really uh, individual and family investment, it it's, uh, really gives us uh, a uh, great deal of satisfaction. Some examples of that, uh, Trio's Italian Grill opened this year. It's a traditional uh, Italian fare with a New World flair from Venice, Rome, and Tuscany. The Spot on Lakeshore Boulevard, which uh, offers breakfast and lunch and a full bar and a really neat party room to the rear, so that's definitely worth checking out for uh, a future event you might be looking to host. Uh, mean Mugs uh, Pub had re has relocated and completely uh, renovated the former Eaton Park uh, restaurant. And then uh, Kiko's Kitchen, and again, Sonia Davis, a new chamber member, is here with us today. Uh, lovely smile there, Sonia. She's the new owner, and she was, this Kiko's is actually named after her mother, Makiko, right? And uh, they offer traditional Japanese street food and, and fusion dishes. Um, we also continue to see uh, tremendous interest in, in housing in our city. This is true throughout all of Lake County. Very difficult to find a house right now. But uh, we did move forward with uh, uh, a few new subdivisions this year. The Brookview Reserve subdivision on State Route 84 at Plaza Boulevard is currently under construction. It's 174 lots on 75 acres. Uh, the Glenbrook Estates is 30 lots on 14 and a half acres. That's just to the east of Blackbrook Golf Course. And uh, the city was able to uh, settle a dispute with um, the uh, Bolton property owners uh, to allow the anticipated uh, mixed-use development that was originally planned to move forward. That'll see about 160 acres of actual development and 80 acres of uh, preserve space. So they're still in search of a developer for that property. And I want to give out a shout out to our uh, planning director, Kathy Mitchell, and her staff. All of these projects that I talked about, um, she and her staff work with from the cradle to grave, and that really wouldn't be possible to keep these things moving efficiently and see the uh, speed, keep up with the speed at which our private sector expects without their efforts, so we appreciate that. And I also want to give a uh, uh, remembrance nod to uh, Bill Snow, who was uh, really a, uh, one of the a giant among, uh, in mentor here over the years. Bill's, Bill passed away this last year. He was our planning chairman for many, many years, uh, a member of the planning commission for decades, a city councilman, Port Authority board, board member, and uh, his mark is really all over this community, so we want to uh, express our appreciation for all his efforts over the years. So this robust economic activity um, has led to uh, very strong financial success for the city. This has actually been a historic year for us. Uh, we had our uh, highest uh, year ever for income tax collections. We collected $56 million. That was up 12% over the prior year. Um, we uh, finished our year with a year-end general fund balance of $29 million, which is also a, a record for us. That represents about, half, about 50 percent of our total general fund appropriations. So uh, again, very solid position to be in. Uh, we also received the Order of States Award with Distinction, and that's the highest honor available for any public financial uh, institution reporting. And Dave Melanowski and his staff um, deserve a great deal of credit for that. And we are putting these revenues to good use. Uh, City Engineer Dave Swigger and his staff have another ambitious infrastructure plan ahead of us for the year. Uh, last year, we did about $3 million in local road construction and improved about 24 streets. 
Uh, this year, we'll do about six million in uh, road construction to improve about 30 streets. Uh, about two million of this will go into the local neighborhoods. Another million dollars will complete, do a complete rehabilitation of Market Street between Hopkins and uh, Center Street. We'll do complete joint repair there and an overlay that uh, it's, if you've driven down there, you know that's desperately in need of, of some work. Um, and also about $3 million of reconstruction on Brooksdale Road, Forest Road, and Woodbridge Lane in the Headlands. And I want to make mention of, 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 this, of those streets in particular because this finishes up uh, a project that we started called the Headlands Area Street Rehabilitation Program. And um, Ward Councilman John Krieger uh, was kind of was the spark for this project. In 2017, we took a look at 11 streets that are immediately to, uh, to the west of Corduroy Road as you cross, um, as you cross the Menor Marsh on, uh, into the headlands. And all 11 of these streets were in a terrible state of disrepair. And we kind of scratched our head and wondered how we were going to actually get this, get this project moving because nearly all of them required uh, complete reconstruction. So in, at that time, we estimated that it would take about $20 million in 10 years to complete that project. Um, I'm happy to say that, construct, that it, and construction began in 2018 and will finish this year. And in just five years, we completed all 11 streets for $11.9 million. We did uh, $7.5 million of that were local funds. We received $2.7 million in grant funding as well as uh, $1.7 million in contribution from uh, the Lake County Utilities Department. So uh, a real success story for us, and uh, um, I know that uh, hopefully that gets Mr. Krieger a few more votes in the headlands this year. <laughs> Coming up. Uh, also uh, want to reflect on another milestone, uh, but 10 years ago, we started our uh, pedestrian safety program, also referred to as our sidewalk program. And 10 years ago, we looked at the state of the sidewalks in our city, and we were not happy with what we saw. Um, so we embarked on what turned out to be a 17-phase project. And to this date, we've completed 12 of 17 phases, and we expect to be uh, completed once through the city by 2026. But at the 10-year mark, I think it's noteworthy to mention the fact that we've actually repaired or replaced 166 miles of sidewalk, 16,000 sidewalk slabs, and with an investment of uh, $3.6 million in both public and private funding. So in 2026, we'll finish up, and then we can start all over again. Right, Dave? Uh, this year, the Hendricks Road Bridge over Route 2 will see a, a complete deck replacement. Uh, that's an ODOT-run project that will start this spring and probably finish by the end of the year. Um, that road will be uh, completely closed at that point uh, for the remainder of the year. Uh, that's about a $3.2 million project. Uh, this year as well, uh, ODOT will bid out this State Route 615 bridge that goes over the railroad tracks. That will be 2023 construction and a $13 million project that uh, will keep one lane open on Center Street. So yeah, we'll get a few groans out of the people in this room when that starts to go forward, I'm sure. But uh, it is necessary, as you can see from those pictures. Um, we've been very fortunate to be able to work um, with a number, with the city of Willoughby and uh, the Lake County Utilities Department on improvements to our um, uh, storm sewer uh, system over the years. And I'm happy to say that we'll be this year, we'll be installing right uh, in a 48 inch additional culvert under North Bay Drive and making other various improvements to Ward Creek between the Mentor and Willoughby Corporation line and the Chagrin River. This is important because um, some of the improvements that we've made to the watersheds on our side have, have greatly helped uh, Willoughby, and this will be uh, something that will greatly help uh, the people that live along that watershed. And so most of the uh, Ward 3 neighborhoods, a lot of the Ward 3 neighborhoods drain into Ward Creek. The, the watershed backs up all the way to the uh, Great Lakes Mall parking lot. So again, heavy rain events it will give our people a lot more confidence once this moves forward. So we appreciate the cooperation we have 
had over the years with the city of Willoughby. Our recreation department, um, the Manor Parks and Recreation has made a soaring comeback in 2021 when public gatherings were actually able to resume and they continue to up their game in all respects and improve the experience uh, for our residents at both the facilities and parks where we serve. And a good example of that uh, was a very recent program that we were actually able to host at our ice arena with uh, Olympic silver medalist Nancy Kerrigan. And uh, it was really kind of cool because she was actually here while the Beijing ice figure skating competition was going on, so we got her insight on that to some extent. Uh, she was able to watch the routines of a number of the mentor figure skaters who train at, at our ice arena, offer them tips and encouragement, and also interact with our residents during an open skate and reception afterwards. So uh, the confidence in Ken Kaminsky and his staff in raising the recreation bar was rewarded by City Council just this past December with the decision to purchase the former Heisley Racket and Fitness Club to create what is now the new Mentor City Recreation Center. So this was uh, a just over a $5 million purchase. It's a 130,000 square foot facility. And it meets the city's very long uh, term goal of providing uh, quality indoor space to provide some uh, diverse indoor programming that we just haven't been able to do for, for a number of years. Um, when you look at the, the, the real value to this of the city, we were, uh, Mr. Malinowski and I were just uh, looking at our city's liability insurance renewal, and we placed this on the schedule for the first time, and our insurance provider placed the replacement value on this structure at $30 million. So uh, a pretty good deal for the city. We're currently working on both short-term plans that are both there, that are aesthetic in nature as well as long-term plans uh, that we hope to have completed by the fall that will look at perhaps even some expansion at that facility. There are many other exciting things happening in our park system. Springbrook Gardens Park, uh, we'll see the construction this year of uh, our community hall there. This is a 4,800 square foot, $2 million facility. It's an all season facility that will have restrooms on both the inside and the outside. It'll be able to accommodate 200 people and be an indoor, outdoor, flexible place to uh, bring families and, and uh, see rentals. Um, we, we are able to move forward with this in part with a half a million dollar state capital grant. We're also going to be doing uh, two shelter houses and installing playground equipment at Springbrook Gardens Park this year. We also uh, move forward with planting a tree farm out there, which was a part of the original master plan. And we'll be using trees nurtured there around the city as part of our citywide uh, tree planting program. And we also uh, completed uh, the second phase of a two-phase stream restoration project. Um, this was actually a half a million dollar investment that uh, improved 1,300 feet of, uh, which was just basically vertical channel that ran through that property. Um, so we restored 1,300 feet of stream and added uh, four and a half acres of riparian habitat, which will greatly enhance uh, the water quality downstream of that. We did that with partners of the Chagrin River Watershed, Lake Soil and Water, and the Ohio EPA, and much of that was done with grant funding. Um, I want to recognize Stephanie Johnson, who is the city's grant coordinator, who has uh, done a fabulous job of literally bringing millions of dollars into the city in, grant, in grants. That's actually a good example of um, the commitment that the city recognizes to uh, maintaining a sustainable community. And, you know, again, uh, in addition to that, we have a number of other projects that are directly uh, related to uh, our sustainability. Um, tree planting is a big uh, agenda item for us every single year. And this year, uh, we will actually look to plant over 750 trees in the city in different locations. Again, a number of partners that we'll be doing that with. But um, I want to recognize Matt Schweikert and, and uh, his staff. They not only are the ones that take care of all that nasty snow and ice when, it, when the, the storms come and fix the potholes and that, but they're also out in front on a lot of these sustainability projects. Um, to, that, to that end, we're also going to be installing two public uh, electric vehicle charging stations in the city. Uh, one will be at Garfield Park and the other at uh, City Hall. 
And we're also the first community in this area to adopt uh, comprehensive legislation on, in our zoning code on the siting of electrical, electric charging stations. And obviously this is a growing everywhere. We anticipate, we've already seen a lot of applications come to private uh, commercial properties in the city and we expect them as well at residential properties. We've also invested a half a million dollars over the last five years, uh, predominantly with grants through uh, NOPAC, our uh, community uh, energy aggregator, to make improvements, energy efficient improvements to uh, city facilities. The Menor Lagoons and Marina is becoming an even more popular destination site. Um, we began this past year uh, a new program called Tunes at the Lagoons in June, July, and August, where we have predominantly local bands uh, just cater to the people that are at the uh, visiting the Mentor Nature Preserve, as well as those who uh, dock at our Mentor Marina. And we'll be continuing that program this year as well, uh, probably with seven different uh, concerts scheduled there. Certainly not to the scale of Mentor Rocks, but uh, fun nonetheless. Uh, we also installed a new handicap accessible kayak ramp this year at a cost of uh, about $83,000. Uh, we're currently under construction for phase three of our dock restoration project. Uh, this is just under 500 feet of uh, bulkhead seawall. This is where our, the boats out there actually dock. Uh, over the last three years, we've invested $1.6 million and in, in done about 1,500 feet of a uh, new dock wall. We have about 18, well, about 18,000 to go, Mr. <laughs> Kaminsky. So, uh, long way to go, but, uh, but we're getting the worst of it. Also, uh, finally, very excited to finally be able to move forward with our shoreline uh, protection uh, revetment extension project. And you see that video up there. Um, that's finishing up actually right now. It's an, it will add an additional 377 lineal feet of stone revetment uh, wall to the east of the existing uh, protective wall that extends uh, into the lake there. Uh, so a total of about 1,000 feet. This is a $1.3 million project, and a million dollars of this funding came through a state capital grant program. And I want to acknowledge Senator Jerry Serino, who was actually the primary mover for that on our behalf. They, they recognized that communities have no, there's no grant sources out there for communities to protect their important public assets. So a program was created and we got the first uh, grant and first sizable grant um, under that program. So we appreciate, we certainly appreciate those efforts. Mentor also joined 12 other communities uh, in this past year to create the Shoreline Special Improvement District. This will allow uh, private property owners along uh, Lake Erie who also have similar uh, erosion problems to be able to make improvements to protect their property using public funding and to be able to have that paid back through assessment on the, project, on the property for up to 20 years. We will be adding a new marine gas stock this year at a cost of $300,000. It a, provides a convenience to our boaters and visitors who come there. And uh, we anticipate that this actually should pay for itself in, in a span of about five years. We'll be adding 50 additional floating docks. Um, this is a, a cost of estimated probably somewhere between a half a million and $700,000. But again, this is something that will pay for itself over time. Uh, we are at full capacity with still a long waiting list at our marina. So we're uh, uh, anxious to be able to accommodate some more boaters there. And uh, we'll also be moving forward with the construction of the Lagoon's Handicap Accessible Boardwalk and Observation Deck. And where you see the writing on that slide is approximately where that boardwalk will go. This will be uh, 400 feet of boardwalk and a large observation deck. As are two phases uh, that have been funded through grants through uh, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And there is a third phase to this project too, which will be approximately an 80-foot observation uh, tower, which we are currently seeking uh, funding for right now. Uh, this year as well, uh, President's Park in Ward 3 uh, saw the completion of a, a half-mile looped walking path. Um, this is a neat, again, this is a neat project because it caters to that particular neighborhood. It also ties in 
with uh, the large, the city's largest uh, storm retention pond, the Horvitz Pond that is uh, in that location. So there's some park benches in there as well and a uh, very, very attractive project. Finally, just turning to uh, Wildwood. Um, the importance of the Wildwood Cultural Center for us uh, cannot really be overstated. It really is the focal point of our commitment to and the advancement of the arts in our city and also a reminder of our, uh, of our uh, uh, rich history. Um, as such, the Council and Administration has committed itself to ensuring its viability and its utility for generations to come. Um, we have had record-breaking numbers this past year on all the events uh, out there. You can see this is our annual uh, wine festival that, that we have. We also started a new event this year. Uh, it was our inaugural golf cart hayride in the fall, and that, had, that was sold out in, in just a matter of days and had over 1,300 participants. Um, but what, what I really want to talk about is the improvements that we're going to be making to the facility itself. Um, we have uh, a long-term plan to really restore that property to um, its, its original and bring some updates to it uh, so that it could be, it be enjoyed for many years to come. We uh, uh, rent it restored and extended the hardwood flooring throughout the first floor. We uh, added natural, working, natural gas working fireplaces. We're going to be removing all of the stained glass windows, restoring them and replacing them. Uh, we excavated the uh, west side of the property this last year to address some water infiltration on the building. We'll be excavating the east side of the building this year. And in, uh, as a part of that, we'll be reconstructing and upgrading the rear patio area. We also expect that we'll probably add air conditioning to at least the ground floor of that uh, coming forward. So excited about that, and that's a multi-year project. At the Civic Center, uh, we will be installing an outdoor exercise network there in that general location. You get some idea of, of what that will look like there. And then I think you know, one of the hottest, usually a hottest spot in the summertime is certainly our, our Mentor Amphitheater. Uh, we will be completely replacing the sound system this year and upgrading it. Uh, believe it or not, sound systems of that type tend to have uh, a five-year life cycle usually. We had over 100,000 people attend our concert series last year, and it was highlighted by some national acts like Lita Ford and the band Cracker. And um, this year, I'm happy to announce uh, some of the acts that we will have there. On the tribute band side, again, tribute, not the actual bands, we'll have tribute bands to Elton John, George Michael, Zach Brown, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, No Doubt, uh, bon Jovi, Matchbox 20, Led Zeppelin, and Huey Lewis in the News. And we'll release a schedule on that shortly. But we also found that the more popular we become and the, and the better we're able to attract sponsors, we're able to add national acts to our lineup. And we're going to be doing that as well this year. Uh, some acts that we have already secured will be the band Fastball. And that will be at one of the Tuesday night concerts. The band Everclear will also be with us on a Tuesday night. And we're also uh, working on uh, finalize a contract with a National Country Act, which we will be um, hopefully be able to announce soon. And also I want to give a shout out to uh, University Hospitals and of course Lake Health, former Lake Health, uh, who actually is our predominant sponsor for the Men Rock series. And we certainly appreciate uh, all their support over the years. At City Fest this year uh, in August, we, will have, we usually have two great nights of music. Uh, the Friday night, we're going to have basically grunge fest at City Fest. We're bringing in two uh, uh, tribute bands. Uh, one is a, the 10 band, which is a Pearl Jam tribute band, and STP2, which is Stone Temple Pilots tribute band. And they, were, uh, they both have performed at our uh, venue in the past to great reviews, so we're glad to have them back. And I'm really happy to announce that on Saturday night, we will have the national recording artist, the Spin Doctors, there to close out um, our City Fest on Saturday night. So we're excited about that and kind of continue to up our game uh, for the Men Rock series. So finally, I also want to mention the great work that is done every day by our communications officer, Ante Lagarsic, and his talented staff who promotes all of these city events relentlessly during the course of the year and tells 
uh, so many great stories uh, to our public. We had actually, we had over a million uh, impressions on social media last year, and just in the last five years, we've actually tripled our website traffic. Um, so they're doing a great job as always. So in conclusion, none of us here today, nor any economist, past or present, can predict with certainty exactly what the economy of tomorrow will look like or what other challenges that might confront us as a community. But we know that there will be change and embracing that change to our advantage will remain the key to our continued success. We find a Mentor today in a very good place, still growing and diversifying, a community that has withstood decades of change and emerged better off for it. The state of our city remains strong and the passion evident in this room uh, by all of you today suggests we will always find a way to keep it so. So I thank you very much, and if there are any questions, I'll be willing to take them. Otherwise, I know you want to get going, and thank you for being here.